meditation this evening comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 20, starting at verse 19. It's found on page 5 of your service folder. Dear friends in Christ, do you ever feel like you're walking on eggshells? Like every word that you speak needs to be carefully chosen and rehearsed ahead of time? These kind of conversations can be tense. We don't want to make a delicate situation any worse than it already is. But we know how often the sinful nature loves to take words and actions in the worst possible way. I don't think anyone enjoys being in a situation where your words might be thrown back in your face. That's physically and emotionally exhausting. And to be honest, a bit spiritually draining. Maybe that's why we're taught to pick our battles wisely. And if we absolutely feel like we need to say something, we follow the old adage, the less said, the better. How incredible, then, are the final steps that our Savior took just before those steps to the cross. In those last days in Jerusalem, he didn't shy away from confrontation. He didn't hide from crowds. He didn't think, the less I say, the better. No, the Gospels are filled with what our Savior said in his final days in Jerusalem. And much of what our Savior said was squared directly at the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders. How amazing and how comforting for us that our Savior's final steps led to his enemies, both those Jewish leaders and you and me. The religious leaders in Jerusalem were trying to bait a trap for Jesus. We hear at the beginning of Luke 20 that they came and asked him a question. Tell us by what authority you are doing these things, they said. Who gave you this authority? Now those leaders, they knew the answer to their question. Jesus had made it crystal clear throughout his ministry that his authority came from God the Father because he was God the Son. He knew that they were trying to trap him with this question. So he replied with his own question, one about John the Baptist's authority. Now those leaders were afraid that if they answered Jesus incorrectly, they would get some group upset with them, so they remained silent. And in their silence, Jesus continued on with the parable before us today. By the time he finished his story, those enemies, those religious leaders, understood Jesus had so perfectly answered their question about his authority, it was as if he struck them in the middle of their forehead with the bullet of God's holy law. Jesus' parables often connected with the Jewish everyday life, and this parable is no different. At that time, the land was filled with farms and vineyards, often owned by foreigners, but run by local farmers. And those tenant farmers might get wealthy off the land because while that foreign owner lived far away, he was content so long as he got an agreed upon percentage of the crop at harvest time. Now, he didn't know if those tenants were being honest about the percentage they were sending him or if they were skimming a little off the top for themselves. Jesus' listeners understood this system of tenant farming and how it was abused. But Jesus takes his parable to another level. The tenant farmers weren't just keeping extra for themselves, but when the owner sent his servants to collect that percentage, what happened to those servants? Servant number one, they beat and sent away empty-handed. Servant number two, the same. Number three, even worse. It says they wounded him. Literally, that word means traumatized him and threw him out. So what happens next? The owner shows astounding patience. In verse 13, we hear, What shall I do? 
I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. According to the laws at that time, under certain conditions, if an owner died without an heir, whoever claimed the estate was allowed to have it, especially if they were the current occupants of the land. So these tenants saw the son approaching, and they must have assumed that the father had died and this son was coming to collect his inheritance. They saw this as an opportunity to gain the vineyard for themselves. What a tragic final mistake they made. Jesus concludes his brief parable with a question. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. As Jesus finished his parable, the crowd that was listening cried out, God forbid, may this not be. Because they understood the point of Jesus' parable. They got it. They knew that Jesus was talking about their nation of Israel. They recognized in this parable an Old Testament prophecy. Isaiah chapter 5 describes the Lord's people in this way. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. And God looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. And later on in that same chapter of Isaiah, he describes the Lord's reaction at what he found in his people. Therefore, the Lord's anger burns against his people. His hand is raised and he strikes them down. The mountains shake and the dead bodies are like refuse in the streets. God's own people were the vineyard in Jesus' parable. And those servants who were sent to collect the percentage but were beaten and mistreated, those are God's messengers, his prophets, men like Elijah, Jeremiah, and John the Baptist, who were sent to proclaim God's good news, but were rejected, wanted for dead. And the consequence for God's people, for what they did to the messengers, those consequences were horrific. We hear how the Old Testament people were carried away into exile by foreign armies, and only after 70 years in Babylon would some Jews return to this land. Also that God, the owner of the universe, could send his beloved son to earth. That son who made sure that his final steps led to his enemies. Even though he knew full well that they would reject and kill him. The religious leaders understood the point of Jesus' parable too. In verse 19, Luke records, The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. Because Jesus' final steps led to his enemies, Jesus was going to hang on a cross just three days later. But this sermon isn't just a short story and a history lesson about some Jewish guys. We too need to hear that Jesus' final steps led to his enemies because those enemies include you and me. After the parable, Jesus spoke these words, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and he on whom it falls will be crushed. What exactly is a cornerstone? And why is it so important? Cornerstones were more in Jesus' day than just maybe an engraved plaque that we put in entryways of churches to signify when the church was built, more than uh, an engraved slab that goes in the wall as we're building it. The cornerstone was the first stone laid in the foundation, and every other stone had to be lined up with that perfect cornerstone. 
On top of that, it bore the full weight and stress of two of the walls of the structure. So cornerstones were very crucial to the integrity of the whole building. Jesus says, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. He was that most important stone that was rejected but had now become the foundation. And everyone listening to Jesus on that Tuesday in the Jerusalem courts, they understood what Jesus meant. And that includes those religious leaders who wanted him out of the picture. They hated Jesus. And partly because the crowds were following him instead of them, but maybe more so because Jesus was preaching the Lord's gospel good news. A message of free forgiveness by grace and not the fake forgiveness that the priests were peddling in the marketplace for their own personal gain. They didn't want people building on Jesus as their cornerstone. And so these leaders arranged to have Jesus arrested just two days later outside the Garden of Gethsemane. And in the next 24 hours, they made sure that he hung on a cross. Their rejection of the cornerstone was complete. But that didn't hurt the cornerstone. Ultimately, it crushed them. Jesus is paraphrasing an old Jewish proverb that goes like this. If a stone falls on a pot, woe to the pot. If a pot falls on a stone, woe to the pot. Either way, woe to the pot. It's going to be crushed to pieces. God forbid that anyone should reject Jesus Christ as the cornerstone because God's righteous judgment is waiting for those who continue to be enemies of our Lord. Dear friends, that is what we once were in our sinful nature as human beings. The Apostle Paul warns in his letter to the Romans, the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. We are enemies of God, hostile to him. We can't do what God wants, and we don't even want to. All the more reason for us to treasure that good news, that Jesus came not just to preach, but to make a reality. For all of his enemies, the entire human race lost in sin, Jesus' final steps led to the cross. For all his enemies, including you and me, Jesus suffered and bled and died. For all his enemies, including you and me, Jesus completed his work that he could wash away every single one of our sins in his blood. And that includes little nitpicky sins that we struggle with in this era of walking on eggshells. When every word is scrutinized and measured in the public eye, when every action is watched like a hawk and often swiftly judged, when the stress of confrontation, at least for some, can be crippling. For times like these, and for sinners like you and me, Jesus' final steps led to his enemies. Through his sacrifice and by his grace, he leads us all through this life filled with pain and danger. He continues to guide us until at last he will lead us in our final steps to our heavenly home. And now, Jesus is the rock that grounds us. That's why he took all his final steps, that he could be the cornerstone of God's church, your cornerstone and mine by faith, that cornerstone that the Apostle Paul writes about to the Ephesians. You have been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. 
Dear friends, stand firm on that rock of Jesus Christ who lived, died, and rose victorious for all his enemies, for you and for me. Amen. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.